It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, before I start, I just want to acknowledge that this is our last day in the Legislature. We'll all be heading off to our ridings, and I want to wish all of our colleagues here in the Legislature a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah. I uh, hope everyone has a safe and wonderful time. And to all of Ontario, enjoy the season with friends and family. Uh, last night, um, the, the questions to the Acting Premier. Nice try. <laughs> the questions to the acting premier. Uh, last night, the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission denied Hydro One approval of their uh, takeover of Avista, citing political interference from the provincial government. As part of the merger agreement, Hydro One now has to pay Avista, uh, Avista a $103 million penalty for failing to obtain regulatory approval. Can the acting premier tell us what impact this $103 million penalty will have on our hydro bills? Deputy Premier. Minister of Energy. Appreciate the thank you, Mr. Speaker. Appreciate the leader of the opposition opposition's question as well. I'd like to wish everybody uh, uh, Merry Christmas and safe travels back to your uh, ridings. Yesterday's news from the U.S. Uh, doesn't change our focus on bringing down hydro rates and protecting the people of Ontario. We will always put the concerns of Ontario families, small businesses, and seniors first. And we remain committed to reducing hydro rates and establishing Ontario's energy advantage. This included, Mr. Speaker, a firm commitment to renew uh, the senior leadership at Hydro One, one that had lost the confidence of the energy customers, and the people of Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, people are having a hard enough time paying the bills in this province. Now it looks like they're going to have to pay the price uh, for the Premier and his Chief of Staff's bumbling attempts to install their allies in the, on the board of Hydro One. The Washington state regulators were pretty clear. This is a government that does whatever they want, whenever they want, and they can't do business with people like that. The Premier said he would clean up the mess at Hydro One. What's his plan to deal with the $103 million mess that he's created? Minister. Well, I, I'm not entirely sure that that was what the decision said, Mr. Speaker, but we can disagree on its contents. Upon assuming, off, assuming office, we acted decisively to keep our promise to the people of Ontario. On June 7, 2008, that is exactly what the people of Ontario decisively asked us to do. Years of Liberal mismanagement led to skyrocketing hydro rates and forced seniors across the province to choose between heating their homes and putting food on their table. This is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. The people of Ontario have an expectation that we will live up to our commitment to reduce their hydro rates and make life affordable for families and small businesses, Mr. Speaker. We are reducing hydro rates, and after years of neglect, our government is finally putting the people who pay their hydro bills each and every month first. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, we agree that things were bad when the Liberals were in power, but now we have a Ford government that's ripping up contracts, raking up penalties and severance payments at Hydro One, trying to install the Premier's allies from City Hall into key executive positions and leaving families to pay the bill. What does the Acting Premier have to say to families now stuck with a $103 million penalty that will be added to their hydro bills? Minister. Well, First of all, I would remind the honourable uh, member that that was one of three regulatory bodies' decisions, and that is not an expected outcome. And Hydro One uh, and Avista uh, are reviewing that decision and considering their options, Mr. Speaker. But as I said earlier, yesterday's news will not change our focus on remaining committed to bringing hydro rates down for the people of Ontario, for families for small businesses, for large job creators who lost an, an, an energy advantage in this province, Mr. Speaker, due to the considerable mismanagement of the previous government and how they dealt with Hydro One. We've inherited this. We've made a commitment to ensure that hydro rates come down for the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and that's exactly what we're delivering. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, my next question is to the leading, uh, rather the leader of the uh, 
the acting premier speaker, sorry. Uh, my contacts are getting a bit blurry. Uh, as we all know, when it comes to putting his own interests ahead of the public interest, the premier doesn't limit himself to Hydro One, unfortunately. We've just received a story from the Toronto Star indicating that Ron Taverner, the premier's pick for the OPP commissioner, purchased a Toronto home privately last year from one of uh, Premier Doug Ford's closest advisors. Yesterday, I asked the premier whether he agrees that we need to have the integrity commissioner look into the appointment process of the new OPP commissioner. I didn't get an answer yesterday, Speaker. Order. Will the acting premier provide one today? Wow. Deputy Premier. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Speaker. Again, I will remind the NDP opposition that the hiring committee was independent of government yeah. and uh, they made a unanimous choice with mm -hmm. Ron Tabner. And I want to say, I want to quote uh, the co-chair of the 23rd Division Community Policing Liaison Committee. As the co-chair of the 23rd Division Community Peace Police Liaison Committee, I've personally watched Superintendent Tabner bring the community together, work towards common goals of community mobilization, safety and crime reduction. He is our champion. He, he embodies great empathy for all and is steadfast in ensuring that all efforts are made to keep our community safe. I hope when Ron Tavner Spons. becomes the OPP commissioner on December 17th, the NDP will finally do what everyone else in this province understands who knows him and congratulate him and thank him for his thank you. Stop the call. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Globe and Mail reports today that the Premier was actively promoting the advancement of Ron Tavener's career since he was a city councillor. Wow. Not surprising, since uh, they were very close friends. Did the Premier mention this close friendship when he was leading the Cabinet discussion on Mr. Tavener's new job? And if so, did anyone, any single Cabinet minister around that Cabinet table, note the conflict of interest? Minister. So again, I will remind the NDP, it was an independent hiring process. They unanimously chose Ron Tavner. Then it came to Cabinet on, De on, uh, order. on Thursday. Session come to order. We supported the unanimous decision of the hiring committee, but don't take our word for it. From uh, the executive director of the Albion Neighbourhood uh, Services, it is with the utmost confidence that Ron Tavner will serve the province in his capacity as the commissioner of the OPP, with as much commitment, integrity, and the highest level of worth eth ethic as he has done serving our city. Oh, we have an excellent candidate Response. as our next OPP commissioner, and I only wish the NDP would understand the level and quality that we have been able That's to secure it. with Mr. Tabner. Well, I can assure the minister what the NDP does very much understand is people wanted and expected so much better than this here, here. after the last election. <laughs> only this government, only this government and this party would fail to see the problem here. The premier personally awarded a family friend the job of OPP commissioner, and instead of clearing the air, the premier has attacked the OPP, claiming that they have low morale, and attacked the integrity of Chris Lewis, of the decorated former commissioner of the OPP, because he was principled enough to speak out on this uh, very bad process. Order. What will the acting premier do? What the premier refuses to do? Apologize to the former commissioner and clear the air with a transparent investigation into this very odious process. Minister. You know, while Chris Lewis has every uh, right to his opinion, at the very least, he wished Ron Tavner well 
and hope that he served the OPP with as, well, as much integrity as he has served for the Member last for 50 years in the City of Toronto. I think it is offensive that you refuse to talk about all of the things that he has done in a very positive way with the City of Toronto. I am honoured and I am thankful that he is willing to continue in that service to the people of Ontario as the Commissioner of the OPP. Order. Start the clock. Next question. Again, Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is to the leader, uh, to rather to the acting premier. After the session the government has uh, had, I'm not surprised that they want to escape early. But families are going to be dealing with the fallout from the premier's decisions Come long inside. after Come he's to get out of here. Whether it's the GM Come workers inside. in Oshawa, speaker, who were told that the premier wouldn't fight for their jobs, students who have lost the hope of accessing university education in communities King, like Brampton, Milton, and Markham, or patients stuck waiting in hallway hospitals, the Premier took care of his friends and families were left paying the bill. Does the Acting Premier think that's fair, Speaker? Deputy Premier. Well, I can only say that after 15 years of neglect on a number of fronts by the previous Liberal government, I am very proud of the work that our government has done. I couldn't hear the Deputy Premier for the volume of the applause. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, what people saw this session was two very, very different visions for Ontario. We said the government should fight to keep GM jobs in Oshawa. The government side said comes the to order. Has sailed. We said cancer patients getting Minister treatment at home resources should come to order. be forced to pay for life-saving drugs. The Ford government compared those patients to, to order. children demanding ice Member cream. For King Bond, we come fought to, order. to raise the minimum wage and ensure working people could take a sick day without losing a day's pay. Lawrence, the Premier to fought order. to create lucrative jobs for his friends. How could this government, after just six months in power have taken us from bad to so, so, so much worse. Minister. We got elected to improve the lives of Ontarians, and that is yep. what we are doing. We are raising things up. We are making life affordable yep. for families. We were left with an enormous deficit, but we are making the change that people expect us to make, to make Number life Eglinton affordable Lawrence, so they don't to have to choose between heating their homes Number and for heating their families. To order. That is what we got elected to do. We got elected to end hallway health care. That is what we're working on. We got elected to make a difference in the lives of families, and that is what we're working on. That is what we're going to continue to do, and we welcome your assistance to do that, because this is something that we Help should us, all be working towards. Towards, to make sure that all of the people that we all represent, their lives become better and more affordable, and that we can create jobs for all of our young people that are graduating from high school, colleges, and universities. That is what we are elected to do, and that is what we are doing. And then I'll be able to recognize the next member who has a question. Start the clock. The member for Burlington. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Honourable Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The Auditor General released her annual report yesterday, and amid all the scandals, waste image management, there were a few statistics that stood out from your ministry. The Auditor says, and I quote, we identified 36 per cent of Ontario Works recipients as having barriers that affect their ability to prepare for work or find employment. 
Service managers across Ontario told us that these barriers include mental health conditions, addictions, and homelessness. End of quote, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this sounds like a disjointed patchwork system that isn't helping society's most vulnerable the way it should. Question. It certainly doesn't sound like it's focused on the recipient. Can the minister tell us what the government for the people is doing different to ensure a path to employment? Children, Community and Social Services. Appreciate the question from the member of Burlington, um, and it's a very important question. I'd also like to say thank you to Ontario's Auditor General for confirming what I've been saying in this House for five long months that the system I inherited from the previous Liberal administration was not working to get the people in Ontario who can get back to work back on track. And that's why I am proud to be part of a government for the first time in 15 years that's working across government through multi-ministerial approaches to get people back on track where they're able to get back to work. And that's why I was proud to work with the Minister of Finance so that we could announce in the fall economic statement lift so people could keep more money in their pockets. I'm working with the Minister of Training, <laughs> Colleges and University so we can have that skills deployment as early in the, in the uh, casework as possible. Working with the Met Minister of um, Response. Uh, Health on mental health and addictions and the Minister of Housing so we can make sure people have supportive housing. I look forward to speaking more about this in the supplementary. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Minister, for your thoughtful and passionate uh, response. The auditor had so much more to say about the dysfunction at Ontario Works. It says, and I quote, since our last audit in 2009, the average monthly number of Ontario Works cases increased by almost 25%, 202,000 to 250,000 in 2017-18. Although Ontario Works uh, is intended to be a temporary assistance program, Speaker, we found that th since 2008-2009, the average length of time people depend on this program has nearly doubled, increasing from an average of 19 months to three years." End of quote. It's an indictment on the previous government, but more importantly, it's disheartening for those who just want to work. Can the minister elaborate on how her plan to give those able to work a hand up and get those ignored by the Liberals back into the workforce? Thank you, Speaker. Yeah. Minister. That's why we're pleased to have had the, the, the advice from the Auditor General over the past five months as we redeveloped our plan because we understood that the uh, system was broken and it was patchwork. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to meet with UMSA, the municipal service providers that are delivering social assistance at the local level. This is what they asked us for at AMO, better local delivery, more wraparound services and supports for those who can work and those who can to make sure that they live life with greater <coughs> dignity. We understand that Ontario Works should be temporary and the ask should be a job in Ontario, not going into a program that they'll trap them into uh, poverty. We know that right now we spend over $10 billion on social assistance. Almost 1 million people are on the programs, yet still one in seven people are trapped in poverty. That's unacceptable. We believe the best social program for those who can work Response. is a job. Yeah. <laughs> Order. The House will come to order. Order. Member for York Centre will come to order. Start the clock. The member for Hamilton West, Ancaster Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is to the acting premier. Uh, before the last election, progressive conservatives said that they would restore the ban on advertising, partisan advertising that's paid for by the people of Ontario. Yet yesterday, not one of the ministers that were responding to the auditor's report seemed willing to answer this basic question. So I'll ask it again. When will the ban on paid partisan advertising happen? The Deputy Premier. President of the Treasury Board. Thank you. Yeah. 
appreciate that. And uh, through you, thank you to the member for that question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, under the Liberals, there was a large jump in government advertising in an election year. I'll let you draw your own conclusion why that may have been. Um, what I will say to the member opposite is that we are exploring all elements of government advertising, including that. So uh, we will make that a priority, as we will in all expenditure items, uh, make it a priority for this government. Now, we welcome the ideas from the, uh, the Auditor General. It's unfortunate that the previous Liberal government gave them so much material to work with. <laughs> but we will, however, endeavor, endeavor to get going immediately on all the Response. recommendations in the Auditor General report, and I'll have more to say in the supplementary. I can't wait. Restart the clock. Supplementary. Well, here we go again. Yeah. Once again, we see the Ford government, government side taking to order. everything from bad to worse. I mean, we've seen that the Premier's meddling at Hydro One will make the Liberal gas plant scandal look like a bargain. And now, instead of cracking government down side on to partisan order. advertising, the Ford government is doubling down. Why is this government so determined to spend public money on partisan promotion? President of the Treasury Board. You missed that, uh, Through you, Mr. Speaker, thank you again for that uh, question from the member opposite. Uh, you know what keeps me up at night, Mr. Speaker, is the deficit. You know what gets me up in the morning is fixing it along with all of my family. My, uh, my, colleague, my colleague just reminded me, uh, asked me how I slept. I said, I sleep like a baby, I wake up every two hours and I cry. Cry over the books the Liberals left us. Yes, thank, thank you, Minister of Finance. We do cry over the books that the Liberals left us. Thank you for that. And the NDP I, I would remember, response. I would remind the member opposite that this was the previous Liberal government's advertising here, here. spending. Here, here. We are going to take every action yeah. like, to clean up the books of this here. province. Stop the clock. The House will come to order so we can continue question period. The next question, the member for Barry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the very prudent President of the Treasury Board. Yesterday, the Auditor General released her annual report. It was shocking to see how the Liberals engaged in a pattern of mismanagement, which has had real and lasting impact on the services we as taxpayers in Barrie Spring, Water, or Medonte, and Thread, Ontario rely on. Not only did this mismanagement result in loss of hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money, it was wasted. It was also put the safety of Ontarians at risk. Yes. Ineffective leadership, reckless overspending, it crept throughout the whole of the previous administration. After 15 years of the Liberals squandering taxpayers' dollars on the watch with the NDP, Ontario elected our government on the promise of restoring trust and accountability to this province. Can the President of the Treasury Board please update this House on the findings of the Auditor General and what actions this government is going to take? President of the Treasury Board. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you to the great member from Barry Springwater, Oro Mandante, for that question. Uh, I would be remiss, uh, first off, to not uh, thank, uh, not forget to thank the uh, Auditor General and her team for the great work that she did in this report. But frankly, Mr. Speaker, the report released yesterday shows just how badly the Liberals let the people of Ontario down. Here are some examples. Ontario Works overpayments of totaling $730 million. Wow. Metrolinks incurred over $400 million in sunk and additional costs between 2009 and 2018. Wow. $400 million. It's shameful that these two examples alone add up to $1.1 billion, wow. Mr. Speaker. Holy. 
You know, that's about the same amount that the province spends annually on Ontario child benefits. Yeah, well, this is waste, Mr. Speaker, yep, that we need here. to fix. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, back to the Treasury Board President. Now, the report did indeed reveal levels of mismanagement that were shameful. For some time now, this House has grown accustomed to hearing of how taxpayers' hard-earned money was squandered by the previous Liberal government. Whether we're talking about trying to undermine the Auditor General in order to apply jointly sponsored pension plans to the province's revenues, or talking about extraordinary lengths they went to to get off the books some of the unfair hydro scheme, the previous government left the credibility of this province's financial uh, reputation in tatters. Can the President of the Treasury Board please inform this House what actions our government is taking to repair the other damage caused by the Liberals? The President of the Treasury Board. Very good question, and thankfully I'm prepared for that question. <laughs> Over the past several months, we have worked closely with the Auditor General in pursuit of our mutually shared goal of improving not just the financial situation of the province, but also the governance and accountability situation as well. Perhaps most disturbingly, uh, the Auditor General discovered that under the Liberals, the Toronto, uh, sorry, the Technical Standards and Safety Authority, TSSA. also known as TSSA, thank you, colleague, well, did not ensure public safety nor fulfilled its obligation, legal obligations to protect the public. That is why yesterday. Minister Walker directed the TSSA to immediately address the concerns raised by the Auditor General. Immediate action. Let me be abundantly right clear. Boom. We are putting an end to waste and mismanagement. Response. While the Liberals only concern, would concern themselves about protecting their seats, we're concerned about protecting Ontario's future. Hey! Start the clock. Next question, the member for Toronto U University Rosedale. Univers Thank you, Speaker. Uh, this is a question for the Minister of Transportation. The Auditor General's report proves how badly the Liberal government let Ontario down by privatizing transit delivery. Giving companies a premium price to build the Eglinton LRT on time and on budget, and then making taxpayers pay hundreds of millions of dollars for cost overruns. Now this government is accelerating Ontario's course, course down the same path, cooking up a secret plan to privatise parts of Toronto subway. Minister, in one year from now, what do you think the Auditor General is going to say about this government's transit plans? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Merry Christmas to Paul Miller, Mr. Speaker, and thank you very much for that question. Um, listen, I think in a year from now, the Auditor General is going to stand up and say, good job, government. You've done well. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, our government was elected to do the right thing and get Ontario back on track. Metrolinx has a new CEO, has a new chair. The government of Ontario has a new premier, a new transportation minister. We're turning the corners. We're going to build transit in this province. We're going to get Ontario moving. We're going to get the economy going, and Ontario is open for business. Start the clock. Supplementary. Back to the minister. The auditor's report confirmed the Liberal government secretly meddled in transit planning for their own political gain. Approving a ghost station in the former transportation minister's own riding, even though Metrolinx had rejected that station location. But this government is taking secrecy and political interference to a whole new level. By eliminating any requirement to talk to the public or local municipalities and by giving the Premier permission to change or override any of Metrolinx's plans. Minister, can you confirm and commit to a firm and fair, transparent public consultation process for all transit planning decisions? Yay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Minister. I wish Paul Miller a Happy New Year as well. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, uh, we have uh, reviewed and accepted the Auditor General's recommendations on the GO station selection and are reviewing all the expenditures. And the, the Ministry is going to work with uh, Metrolinx to determine which investments will proceed. 
including the Kirby and Lawrence GO stations. And uh, the ministry is also proposing changes to the Metrolinks so we can clarify the roles and responsibilities with respect to planning and decision making. And Mr. Speaker, I can fully tell the minister, uh, member opposite that my riding will not be getting a GO station or a subway stop. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Uh, first, to all of my colleagues here in our legislative family, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Diwali, Happy Kwanzaa. And I want you to know that I'm going to miss the love that I feel every day from all of you when we're in here. And in the spirit of Christmas, this question is not about how the Premier gave his ex-party president a $350,000 job or a $350,000 a year job to his tour director or the fiasco that's the appointment of the new OPP commissioner. My question is simply this. Can the Deputy Premier please explain to us why the Ontario controller's signature is not on this year's public accounts? The Deputy Premier. The President of the Treasury Board. President of the Treasury Board. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think this is my colleague's way of saying this is my Christmas present from them. <laughs> um, you know, I, I can't comment on uh, the controller uh, and the, the lack of signature. We, the Auditor General delivered her opinion. It was the clean opinion for the first time wow. in three years. Three years. Um, three years. But I will talk about how we got, went about getting a clean opinion. First off, uh, we listened to the Auditor General, who for years did not agree with the accounting of the previous Liberal government's books. Number two, the Financial Accountability Officer did not agree with the, nope. the government's here, books. Here. Neither did the debt credit rating agencies. Neither did multiple uh, the markets who, uh, who didn't agree with that. But finally, we asked an independent commission of inquiry, respected individuals, independent of government, to opine on Fox. the books of the government. And I can tell you that they all disagreed with the uh, previous Liberal government, and we issued a uh, government. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, so uh, I want to thank the minister for that lump of coal in my stocking. So, so here is why the controller's signature is not on this year's public accounts. She was forced to leave in September because she did not agree with the accounting decision made by the government. She said she could not put her professional attestation on the public accounts. Government side Cindy Gino was the first out of 62,000 candidates in the CPA exam in, in America. She is an expert in pension accounting. And here's what she had to say. I believe that the consolidated financial statements of the province of Ontario as issued materially overstate the deficit of the province this year. Speaker, the government is overstating the, the, uh, the deficit as a context for cuts, and we've already seen those cuts Inside to health care, to education, to social services, to the things that families depend on. So my question, Speaker, to the minister is, why are you overstating the province's deficit? President of the Treasury Board. The Mr. Speaker, uh, thank you to the member for that question. But I have to respectfully ask you know, why uh, you are not supporting this Auditor General. And I think the people of Ontario rendered their verdict, Mr. Speaker. But let me take an opportunity to quote uh, from the, uh, the uh, erstwhile uh, NDP finance critic in April of 2018. Ontario's families and businesses know their Independent members much come to order. order. They feel it every month when they open their hydro bill. And today, the Auditor General reported that the Liberal Hydro Plan will drive up bills yet again as a result of bogus accounting scheme. Today, the AG reported that the Wynne government's pre-election report is not a reasonable presentation of Ontario's finances. What the AG has confirmed is that the Liberal Hydro scheme is designed to conceal Spons. billions of dollars in hydro debt from the public. Can I ask the erstwhile NDP finance cricket, why don't you support the Auditor General? <laughs> Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you, Mr. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I think my colleagues might like my cardigan. Thank you. For that. Uh, good. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, I know that the Minister has a long history in this House of fighting to reduce red tape and regulations that are holding back Ontario businesses across a number of sectors. The fall economic statement very clearly laid out our government's commitment for the people to cutting red tape 25% by 2022, and that's a challenge I know the minister takes seriously. After all, in Todd we trust. Can the minister give more detail to the House about the next steps that our government is taking to reduce red tape for businesses and services in Ontario? Great question. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Willowdale and just comment on that beautiful cardigan that he's wearing today. And uh, all he needs is a pipe and a rocking chair, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yesterday, uh, actually later today, later today, I'm going to be introducing the Restoring Ontario's Competitiveness Act. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Speaker, this bill, if passed, is going to be another step in our government's commitment to opening Ontario, opening up, open up for business, and uh, cutting red tape. Speaker, a lot of people think red tape is just about business, but it isn't. It's about service as well, and that's why the Restoring Ontario's Competitive Act, Co Competitiveness Act is going to cut red tape that's standing in the way of opening more childcare spaces in Ontario, and it's going to create good jobs for the people of Ontario. Red Spons. tape is hurting customer services for businesses, but it's also hurting customers Customer services, and that's why we're going to make sure that Ontario is competitive again with this bill, Mr. Speaker. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the minister for his response. And I know that the minister and his parliamentary assistant, Braveheart Parsa, have talked to small businesses in my riding, and their input has gone into our government's approach to red tape. Speaker, on November 29th, one of the members opposite said that the idea of cutting red tape by 25 per cent made him shudder. Well, in my riding of Willowdale, Mr. Speaker, small business owners are shuddering with joy that our government is committed to getting red tape out of their way. Remember, Mr. Speaker, under the Liberals, uh, one particular business owner said that moving his production facility from Ontario to Ohio was like moving, and I quote, from a torture chamber to a candy store. Wow. Wow. Speaker, can the minister tell the House more about how Restoring Ontario's Competitiveness Act will help all businesses in the great province of Ontario? Minister. Well, I, I can say we're going to get some candy canes out later today when we introduce uh, the bill restoring Ontario's Competitiveness Act in the legislature. Mr. Speaker, I thank Stan the man for the question this morning, a great advocate for small businesses in Willowdale. In fact, Speaker, you know, just one of the changes in this bill, which, by the way, contains uh, 32 concrete actions across 12 different ministries of government, it's going to reduce the cost by $5 million per year. The total package of reforms is going to reduce the cost of doing business by almost $25 million. So this is going to play a major, major role in making businesses more competitive in Ontario. And we're also uh, rethinking the province's approach to red tape, Mr. Speaker, where we can we're harmonizing our regulatory standards with existing federal standards Response. so that there's one set of paperwork and the burden on small business owners will go down. Mr. Speaker, this is great news for businesses across the country. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Yesterday's Auditor General report uncovered that Legal Aid Ontario is spending $21 million a year on ODSP application and appeal cases. That's 44 per cent of the total caseload. And the more incredible news is, in three quarters of these ODSP appeal cases, people initially denied support are getting their decisions reversed. Speaker, this PC government is making a bad situation worse by changing the definition of disability to one that is more narrow and rigidly defined. 
practically guaranteeing there will be more appeal cases. Does the acting premier understand that Legal Aid Ontario will receive more cases from people denied ODSP once the new exclusionary disability definition is in place? Uh, Deputy Premier. To the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Attorney Speaker. General. Thank you. Bless you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, first of all, Mr. Speaker, um, to the member opposite, um, she's making presumptions uh, on the, what the de definition of the disability will be. Uh, we are working. We are working on that. My ministry is working with the Ministry of Children uh, and uh, Community Safety. Uh, sorry, Children's Services, Minister of Many Things, to, do, to, to come to the right definition to help lift people out of, uh, of poverty and to make sure they get the services they need. With respect to Legal Aid Ontario, uh, we thank the Auditor General for the work that she's done, identifying things that our government is going to need to do to fix a system that is not helping people get the access to justice that they need. We've invested, the government has invested billion millions of dollars hundreds of millions of dollars in Response. legal aid ontario and i thank the auditor general for pointing out some very important things that we can look at to ensure that more and more ontarians who need access to justice can in fact get access to justice supplementary thank you speaker there are no assumptions here the minister of community and social services actually said that the definition will align with the federal definition which is an exclusionary definition and thousands of other people with disabilities will be cut off of services and support Speaker, there are so many other things that legal aid could be doing if they weren't so busy doing the work the minister should be doing oh. and fighting to get people the support they need and deserve. According to the auditor's report, community clinics indicated that due to the high volume of ODSP cases, they were less able to take on cases re related to employment law, human rights, and issues that impact seniors. But with the government's new disability definition that is designed to exclude more people, this will make matters worse. Speaker, would the acting premier rather legal aid spend all of their time on ODSP appeals that they likely will win, or will she ensure the definition of disability is inclusive of those that experience acute, long-term, and intermittent disabilities? The Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government wants to ensure that people who need access to legal services are able to do that through Legal Aid Ontario, and we will be working very hard in conjunction with the recommendations made by the Auditor General to strengthen those that access to justice for people in need. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General also said that the Legal Aid has been in a deficit situation for two years. Ontario continues to face unprecedented demand for refugee and immigration legal aid services, and the federal government is not stepping up to provide its its fair share of funding to support its own refugee and immigration policies. Opposition Ms. Come order. Mr. Speaker, LAO continues to refine more robust processes for analyzing the use of its funding and implementing changes over time. And my ministry will continue to work with Legal Aid Ontario to ensure that we continue to develop those processes so the people who need access to justice are able to get Response. that. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Next question. The clock. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Transportation. Our government for the people is committed to getting the people of Ontario moving so that they can spend more time with their family, friends and loved ones. Here, here. My constituent in Richmond Hill has been coming to me to complain that they do not want to sit in the traffic congestion or wait in the crowded platform for here, transit. Here. Unfortunately, Ontarians have had 15 years of a Liberal government, supported by the NDP, who were fiscally irresponsible. Yesterday, the Auditor General released a report that clearly indicates just how disastrous things were under the previous Liberal government. And she called for a swift action by this government. Can the Minister of Transportation 
share with the member of this House just how fiscally irresponsible the previous government was with our transportation system and how much taxpayers are on the hook for this mismanagement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I I would like to thank the member from Richmond Hill for the excellent question and, and for advocating consistently and constantly for her uh, constituents in Richmond Hill. So thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the opportunity to speak about the Auditor General's report yesterday. And, and our government for the people was elected in June to get Ontario back on track. And we do have a lot to fix, Mr. Speaker. The Auditor General's report highlights the problems that existed under the previous Liberal government. The report has served as a reminder of the previous Liberal government's mismanagement, particularly on the transportation file. Okay. However, Mr. Speaker, Ontarians elected a PC government on June 7th with a clear and transparent mandate. Metrolinx now has a new CEO and a new chair. And this marks the beginning of a new Metrolinx, and our government is excited and already working with them to get the people of Ontario moving. Response. Mr. Speaker, we have a plan to accomplish our, our many tasks ahead of us, and I look forward to further sharing information in the supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister of Transportation, for that response. It is no surprise that the Auditor General's report criticizes the interference of Metrolinx under the previous Liberal government, Shame. which the NDP continuously propped up. Oh. However, Premier Ford campaigned on a commitment for to build a better transit for Ontarians by the overwhelmingly electing a PC majority government. Yay! We want to achieve the best value for the customer, the Ontarian taxpayer. We're investing on the people of Ontario. We will provide transit service that makes sense. Our government is partnering with the private sector Question. to seize opportunities to build transit that best serves the people in Ontario. Here, here. Here, here. Can Minister share with the members more on the government's plan to get Ontarians moving? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Minister. Thank you again for that question. Mr. Speaker, our government for the people has a transit plan that will get Ontarians moving while saving money. As the member stated, we're working in conjunction with the private sector to seize on opportunities like transit-oriented development. Mr. Speaker, the Mimico GO station is a prime example of this already at work. It's a brand new station with Parkway and Greenway, and it's paid for all by the developer. This also promotes and creates mixed-use communities around stations, which means people get to and from their homes easily and allows more times with friends, family, and loved ones. This saves taxpayers money and gets new stations built. Going forward, these are the kinds of great partnerships our government for the people will be looking for as we do each transit project. The days of Liberal cabinet ministers politically interfering and mismanaging transit files are over, Mr. Speaker. Ontario has turned the co corner. The days of building transit, the days of being transparent are back at Ontario. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The Auditor General's report showed that 36 per cent of Ontario's work recipients are experiencing mental health issues, addiction and homelessness that act as barriers to employment. Our mental health care system, addiction services and housing are failing to provide people with the support they need to get their lives back on track. With this government cutting $330 million from mental health and addiction services, can the minister explain Order. how that will help OW recipients rebuild their lives? Deputy Premier. Well, I, I thank the member for the question. This is a serious concern, but I, I disagree with the premise. Uh, what we are doing is adding significantly to the mental health and addiction system with a commitment of $3.8 billion over 10 years, which is going to address across the spectrum the care needs of people with mental health and addictions issues in Ontario. This is a significant increase that is going to deal with issues like housing, with timely access to treatment, with making sure that 
that we can deal with addictions issues across the province. That is what I disagree with with your question, but I do agree that, that we do need to make this a priority. Yep. That is what we did make a priority during our election promise to the people of Ontario, and that is what we're going to follow up on. We are going to develop and implement a coordinated and comprehensive mental health and addiction system. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Minister. People on OW who are living with mental health and addiction issues need the support from this government to rebuild their lives. What they don't need is a government paying lip service to tackling the problem while making the problem worse by restricting the definition of disability for ODSB recipients, virtually ensuring people with mental health and addiction issues will have a harder time getting the support they need or cutting the $330 million much-needed mental health services. How can the minister justify taking actions that will make life harder for people with mental health and addiction issues while claiming to help them? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, through you, I must say that I disagree with it. The entire premise of that question, because what we are doing no is no trying facts. to help people with mental health and addiction problems. We want to make sure that they can get out of poverty. We want to make sure they have housing. We want to make sure they can find employment. There, these are significant challenges that people are facing, and we are going to deal with them by engaging in a series of consultations. I would be happy to speak with you about it to get your ideas. We need ideas from all of the people of Ontario, but we are going to make sure that we speak with. Um, uh, people in this legislature. We're going to speak with health care stakeholders. We are going to speak to the people of Ontario and directly speak to people with lived experience because they are going to tell us what they need and we are going to make sure they get the services they need to deal with their mental health issues, to deal Response. with addiction issues. That is going to be my priority for the next number of months until we make sure we get it right and we can implement it as quickly as possible. Great plan. Thank you. Stop the clock. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Aurora, Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Great minister. Yesterday, the Auditor General released her 2018 Value for Money, Money Audit of the Technical Standards and Safety Authority, the TSSA. The auditor revealed a number of shocking and concerning issues with the TSSA operation that the previous Liberal government ignored for 15 years. Shame. The report revealed that the TSSA had oversight processes that were ineffective in ensuring public safety for Ontarians, nor had the TSSA fulfilled their legal responsibilities. Mr. Speaker. In fact, the auditor said that the TSSA portion of the, her report was the, most, the part that concerned her the most. Wow. From roller coasters to elevators to pipelines, we must ensure that the public safety is our top priority. Here, here. Can the minister inform the legislature on how we can correct the, num the numerous problems caused by the lack of government oversight over the last 15 years of liberal reign? Minister of Government and Human Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my honourable colleague from Aurora Oak Ridge. Richmond Hill for Parson, the question. PA Speaker, my colleague is correct. The Auditor General's findings are disturbing and unacceptable. What the damning report revealed is 15 years of the previous Liberal government abdicating its oversight responsibility, leaving issues with the TSSA unaddressed, and most importantly, the safety of Ontarians at risk. Unlike the Liberals, Mr. Speaker, who dissed the AG for holding them to account and doing her job, we welcome her report. We welcome the feedback and recommendations sure. in strengthening operations at the TSSA. We are taking decisive action to address these issues. Within an hour of the release of the report, I requested the TSSA board to come back with me with a report and recommendations by January 31, 2019. We will work very closely with the TSSA Response. on implementing the Auditor General's recommendations. We are currently examining options on improving elevator safety and availability and oversight, especially in the TSSA. And, Mr. Speaker, I want to ensure that people their safety is our priority. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the minister for his response and for the work that he and his ministry colleagues are doing to get the TSSA back on track. Yes. Mr. Speaker, these findings are disturbing. 
It shows the Liberals were asleep at the switch throughout their 15 years in power Jay. and failed in ensuring that TSSA was doing its job. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General has found a long list of areas where the TSSA was not fulfilling its role and where the Liberal government was not fulfilling its oversight role. These range from numerous safety concerns around elevators, lack of record keeping for propane storage, to issues with a postered and stuffed article program. My question for the minister is, how can we correct the numerous failures of the previous Liberal government and question. put the safety and security of Ontarians back at the centre of TSA's mandate? Mr. Thank, you. Minister. thank you, Speaker. Again, thank you as well to my colleague for a very important and pertinent question. Unlike the previous Liberal government, we view independent oversight as a cornerstone of ensuring accountability and transparency in government. The Auditor's findings are very, very concerning to our government. The people of Ontario need to feel very comfortable and safe when they walk into an elevator, yeah. go on a roller coaster, like or work with boilers and pressure vessels like Mitch, of course. Yeah. Why, Mr. Speaker, for 15 years did these issues not get addressed by the Liberals? Why did they abdicate their responsibility, Speaker? This is simply unacceptable. Action is the difference. We're going to take action. We're going to get right to business, Mr. Speaker, here, here. and that is exactly what we're going to do. As I said earlier, I have asked for a report by January 31, 2019, and an implementation plan to take action, and I'm also seeking more rigor in the Chief Safety Officer's performance. Mr. Pretty Speaker, much. I want to assure the people of Ontario who have given us the privilege to serve them that their safety is our absolute here, here. priority. Here, here. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. This week, I received a letter from the Minister of Education regarding funding for the Thames Valley District School Board. The minister said in one breath that all the money remains in place and those projects will move forward. And then in the next breath, she said the boards now must submit appropriate designs that fit within the ministry's benchmarks. Would the ministry inform the House what the new benchmarks the Thames Valley District School Board has to now meet in order to move forward with long planned upgrades and repairs? The Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. And so I'm pleased to respond to the member opposite. And uh, I have to share with you as well that the Minister of Transportation has done a wonderful job tracking this issue as wonderful well man. for the wonderful. community. In terms of where we need to go in these repairs and the upgrades that are required in the schools, we actually are working with the school board and our capital branch has been very explicit with regards to what the school board needs to be doing in terms of not only sharpening their pencil, but also making sure they're making decisions that best equip a safe and secure, supportive learning environment. Thank you very much. Speaker, although the ministry indicates there's no holdup in the funding, the money has not flowed, and the letter says that the board needs to, to submit several new plans. Minister, Thames Valley District School Board has yet to receive funding they were promised. That is literally the definition of a delay. When the minister, when will the minister be clear with the school boards and tell them what the new hoops they need to jump are through in order to get? funding that they were promised. Minister. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, again, I referenced the Minister of Transportation earlier because I think he would concur with me when I say that when the new board and the trustees are in place, that's where we're going to see a lot of movement take place. Because the fact of the matter is, our capital branch has been very explicit. They've been very explicit with what Thames Valley needs to be doing in terms to access the allotted money that is waiting for them to move forward with their schools. Thank you very much. Order. Order. Start the clock. Next question. The member for Milton. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. This week, 
we celebrate National Christmas Tree Day, the Canadian Christmas tree growers have declared first Saturday in December as the Christmas Tree Day. Buying Ontario trees generate $11.3 million in sales for Ontario farmers and related businesses every year, Mr. Speaker. Almost everywhere in North America, and certainly in Ontario, Christmas trees are grown as crops on tree farms. Families in my great riding of Milton and across this province look forward to getting together and traveling to their local Christmas tree farm throughout this month to pick a perfect tree for their home. Can the minister please tell us why shopping locally for a real Christmas tree during this Christmas season is important? Oh, minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Milton for the question. Each year, nearly 625 Ontario Christmas tree farms produce more than 1 million Christmas trees. As the member mentioned, buying Ontario trees puts $11.3 million in the provincial economy every year. The Christmas tree industry em employs thousands of Canadians to not only on farms, but also in transportation and retail. I had the opportunity to visit the Toronto Christmas Market with our Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry and my parliamentary assistant last week, where we got to see the giant Christmas tree at the market and celebrate the occasion with some of our Christmas tree carols. I encourage everyone to buy a real local Christmas tree this holiday season and support Ontario farmers who work so hard to bring the very fresh fir, pine and spruce Christmas trees to your family each year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the minister for encouraging everyone to shop local and support their local Christmas tree farmers this holiday season. Here, here. For every Christmas tree harvest, harvested for the holidays, two new ones are planted to regenerate Ontario tree farms. Wow. Christmas trees are among the most environmentally friendly crop because tree is harvested only after 10 years. Here, here. To ensure future harvest, 90% of the farms must remain in trees all the time. Can the minister please tell this House how else our government for the people is supporting families, farmers during this Christmas tree industry? Oh. Minister. I, I could, Mr. Speaker, but I think the Minister of Natural Resources could do it much better. Oh. Refer it to him. Oh. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want to thank uh, the member for his question as well. I'd like to take this opportunity to commend the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs for his hard work in promoting Ontario's homegrown Christmas tree industry. Here, here. Many of us have cherished memories of Yuletide spent around the Christmas tree, and the smell of a fresh-cut balsam or pine is often enough to remind us of that special time of year when we gather with family and friends. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry is pleased to support our Christmas tree industry through Ontario Wood a partnership with the broader forest sector, forestry sector that promotes their products, whether they be building materials, furniture, finishing pieces, artisan products, or Response. our beloved Christmas tree. I'd like to encourage everyone to get a natural tree and wish everyone a happy National Christmas Tree Day, a very Merry Christmas, and a happy and healthy New Year. Thank you. Stop the call. Question the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy, Northern Development, Mines and Indigenous Affairs. Minister, let me frame this for you. We've spoken about this quite a few for over the last couple of weeks. There is a mill, a stagnant mill, that has been idle in Shaflow for quite some time. There has been an Indigenous component to it of interest. There has been an industry component of interest to it. NOHSC has released their interest to it, causing a bid. The bid went out. There are two competing entities that are looking for it right now. At this point in time, a salvage 
is what is going to be done with this mill. A salvage, you know and I know what that means for the community. Loss of opportunities, loss of jobs, loss of development, loss of op and, and, and just growth for this community in Chapleau. Northern Ontario is very strong in forest industry. We need your help with this one. What is this government going to do instead of letting this mill go into a salvage? Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the honourable member's question. Uh, this uh, was brought to my attention last week, and our officials are following up on this. Uh, we're focused on a strategy for Northern Ontario that will open us up for business. Stagment, stagnant for more than 15 years, the decade and a half of darkness left many mills, left many resource operations shut down for extended periods of time. High energy costs. We now have clearly, Mr. Speaker, a skill set, skilled tradespeople to go in and work in many of these uh, many of these places. So I can assure the member opposite that the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund and our commitment to being open for business will take a serious look at any opportunity in Northern Ontario, particularly as they pertain to opportunities with Indigenous communities partnering Response. with the private sector to create good jobs for all communities across Northern Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, look no more. The opportunity is knocking at your door. There is an industry here who is looking at getting this going. They're waiting for you to come to the table. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Come to Chapleau. Come meet with the industry. Meet with the local people that are there that are willing to make this work. I know the member from Timmins have come, has crossed the floor many times talking to you. I've walked across the floor and mentioned it to you. This is an opportunity that we cannot miss. I don't care how we get it done. I don't care who comes there to cut the ribbon. Let's get this meal done. Don't pass out this opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Minister. Speaker, it's, it's true they walk across the floor so many times it makes me think they want to stay. Uh, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you it, 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 who's knocking at my door. People in the forestry sector, in the mining sector, who are tired of red tape, who are tired of high taxes, who can't aff afford a job-killing carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. We drive larger trucks longer, farther distances, Mr. Speaker, and the opposition's calling for a carbon tax to be the highest in the world, Mr. Speaker. I can guarantee, I can guarantee the member opposite and all of his colleagues that we're committed to opening Northern Ontario for business. And as I close, Mr. Speaker, in particular, I would like to wish all of my Northern Ontario colleagues not just a Merry Christmas, but safe travels across our vast and beautiful ridings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That may have been the final question period of 2018. I understand the member for Niagara Falls has a point of order. Yes, on a point of order, I, my, my colleague Jenny Stevens and myself have just found out that Jim Bradley, who was our colleague here and sat in this house for over 40 years, has just been elected the new regional chair of Niagara. I just want to say congratulations. We look forward to working with him. I understand the member for Ottawa South would like to speak to the same point of order. The firm for this House said Jim, Jim Bradley was indeed a Liberal. I know he crossed party lines, yeah. And I know that the government is looking forward uh, to him taking his position as regional chair in Niagara. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Here, here. Point of order, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today, on December 6th, National Day of Remembrance and Action on Violence Against Women, I'd like to say the name of a beloved member of the Black queer community, my community, in this house. Her name was Samaya Dalmar, a Black Somali, Muslim, transgender woman who experienced anti-Black racism, Islamophobia, and transphobia. I wish all of you got a chance to meet her. Her beauty and brilliance would have filled any room she was in. She died suspiciously on February 22, 2015, in Toronto. Her death remains unsolved. Samaya Dalmar's life mattered. Thank you.
The member for Niagara West. Thank you, Speaker. I wish to add my voices. Uh, I can assure you uh, that Mr. Bradley did not sit with our caucus, uh, but uh, I had the opportunity to serve with him in opposition. I look forward to serving with him for the good of Niagara. <laughs> member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I'd like to warmly welcome to the Legislature my very best friend in the entire world uh, who goes back to high school with me, Tia Maricalio. Uh, thank you for joining us today. It is now time to say a word of thanks to our legislative pages, and I would ask them to assemble. Is that all of them? Is that everybody? words. Our pages are smart, trustworthy, and hardworking. They are indispensable to the effective functioning of the chamber. They cheerfully and efficiently deliver notes, run errands, transport important documents throughout the precinct, and make sure that our water glasses are always full. We are indeed fortunate to have them here. Our pages depart, having made many new friends and with a greater understanding of parliamentary democracy and memories that will last a lifetime. Each of them will go home and carry on, continue their studies, and will no doubt contribute to their communities, their province, and their country in important ways. We expect great things from all of you. Maybe some, some of you someday will take your seats in this House as members or work here as staff. We wish you all the best, and thank you again for serving as pages. Now, before we recess the House, um, I have something that I want to say to all of you before I extend my Christmas greetings, and it's a good thing you're sitting down. <laughs> Today is, in effect, the last day of the first sitting of the 42nd Provincial Parliament of the Province of Ontario. To paraphrase the greatest parliamentarian, Winston Churchill, we are a long way from the beginning of the end of the 42nd Parliament, but at least we have come to the end of the beginning. 2018 has been a very challenging year for all of us, members and staff alike. The frantic months leading up to the June 7th election, the early resumption of the House after the election was over, the special summer sitting, which quickly blended into the fall sitting, with members and staff learning their new duties and responsibilities, having had little time to prepare. For all of us in this legislature, the demands of our roles can seem relentless, the days long and hard, and the challenges insurmountable. Yet each working day, all of us on both sides of the House seek to make progress towards the goal that motivated us to run for office in the first place, that being the desire to build a better province in our time and for the generations to come. While we may differ on how to best achieve that goal, broadly speaking, we all share it. We are not enemies across the aisle. We are colleagues. We are parliamentarians. And that is the basis upon which we should debate the issues before us. The people of your ridings have entrusted each of you to come here to represent them and speak on their behalf. And in turn, your work here is only possible because of your respect for the people of your ridings who sent you here, your passion for public service, and your deep desire to make a positive difference for your communities, for Ontario, and for Canada. You are their voice. You are all leaders, and your commitment, your caring, and your candor can validate the trust that your constituents have placed in you. I am privileged to serve as your speaker. Thanks, thanks again for conferring that responsibility upon me. Helping me to perform this role, I want to especially thank the deputy speaker, the other presiding officers of the House, our clerk and table staff, our sergeant at arms, the staff in the speaker's office, Rachel Nada and Monica Weber, indeed all the staff of the Legislative Assembly, 
who serve the people with dedication and professionalism, just as members seek to do. We now have the chance to go home to our families and reconnect with our friends and the people of our ridings. We can also reflect upon the kind of leaders we aspire to be and the kind of province we seek to build. I want to wish all of you a season's greetings, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and all the best in the new year. Recessed until 1 p.m. <laughs>